York Station opened in June 1877, when it was the largest station in the world, slightly larger than London's Liverpool Street at that time, capable of handling 11 trains at once, and with a roofed area significantly bigger than London's Liverpool Street and St Pancras stations. It was the outcome of a building campaign that had lasted approximately five years and involved a complete renewal of York's railway infrastructure. The background to this was that the city walls, the medieval walls opposite the station, hemmed in the original York station built 30 years earlier, which for prestige reasons had been sited in the heart of the city. By 1870, if you came here, the area occupied by the present station would have been pasture land with a few industrial railway buildings scattered around the edge of it. And the old station, which included passenger and freight and coal yard facilities, was absolutely bursting at the seams. The man tasked with finding a solution was the chief engineer of the North Eastern Railway, then Britain's fourth largest railway company, Thomas Elliot Harrison. He'd been involved with railways since the early years, the 1830s, and he had long had plans maturing to deal with the bottleneck at York. What he did, basically, was to create a new railway outside the city walls. It curves round just outside the walls here, if you like, almost glancing against the city so as to provide the station as near as possible to the heart of the town without suffering the constraints of being within it. Work started in 1872 on building the new railway and it was planned in phases to minimise the disruption to traffic, passenger and goods traffic, at a time when the railway was the essential transport lifeline of the country. You couldn't afford to have it shut down for more than a few hours on a Sunday. It had to keep going. Harrison, the engineer, was assisted in the design of the station by the railway's architect, Thomas Prosser. They worked together as a very effective team. And what they produced, as you can see, is a fairly sumptuous essay in the great arched train sheds, building on work undertaken previously in Newcastle in 1850 by Brunel at Paddington in the early 1850s. The result is a very striking building, but design was not just the, the only essential part of the, the engineer's work. It was to plan the whole project carefully in stages and also to persuade his directors, who had to finance the scheme, of the importance of making provision for the new station in their long-term plans. So 20 years before work got underway, Harrison was convinced of the need to build a new station sooner rather than later to ease the immense congestion that was you know, troubling rail traffic at York. And so he persuaded his directors to purchase what were then poor quality pasture fields outside the city walls at what was a fairly low agricultural price before they came under pressure for urban and industrial development. So this is an important part of the engineer's role, anticipating what the client's needs are likely to be sometimes before the client realises it themselves and gently persuading them to go on and make the necessary preparations for it. The Great Iron Train Shed was placed in the hands of a notable Yorkshire firm of iron founders, Butlers of Stanningley. And it's a curious feature of its history that the same company successfully tendered for the several subsequent enlargements of the station itself and also for its reinstatement after incendiary damage in 1942, which actually burnt out the whole southern or left-hand half of the train shed. It was reinstated uh, extremely well. We see here two generations of roofing technology. The original great iron shed itself and its arch spans and the much lower platform roof which was built 30 years later in, in 1909 and whose lightweight elegant design was made possible by the introduction of steel into building technology 
roughly about 1890 when it had just been successfully used, of course, in the Fourth Railway Bridge. It is clear enough from the 19th century the, the sort of semi-heroic opportunities which existed for civil engineers at that time. Well, heroic is perhaps the term in which they were painted by writers of that period. The challenge and the opportunities are just as great today. There is just as much scope for engineers to help reshape society and make it fit the needs of the remainder of the 21st century and the satisfaction to be gained from making a tangible difference to the functioning of society and, and the country and its infrastructure is no less than the satisfaction gained by our predecessors.